So I'd like to present our work and sense uh, capacitive coupling based dynamic microfinger gesture recognition. This was done at Woodlab with my collaborators Viet Nien, who is not here. Uh, he's planning to go to Viet, uh, Vietnam soon, so he's not here to present. Uh, and Lu Yan, Professor H Dr. H. Howard, and uh, Marco. So uh, we envision future workspaces to have head mounted devices that work with uh, augmented reality and virtual reality devices. So the idea is more and more workspaces will have digital information overlaid on the real world, and there will be a need to interact with these devices while you're wearing them. So some examples of some places where this has already been implemented are uh, the Philips prototype where it can be used in operating uh, theater uh, or a couple of companies in the construction sites and industrial shop floors in Germany where people have already deployed these head mounted devices. But the issue is interacting with them in a non intrusive and intuitive way uh, that's also uh, immersive and does not in uh, interfere with the person doing the particular work. So, what we thought was instrumenting these gloves, or finding a way to not instrument the gloves, but instrument the hand, so that those interactions are preserved and it's easy to interact with uh, the set and mounted device. So some existing technologies that quickly run over uh, are, uh, say, cameras like the HoloLens. They already come with cameras which can detect your gestures. The only issue is that there is certain privacy concerns. Uh, they're not really good at picking out really fine, uh, low granular gestures, and your hands need to be in the field of view. Uh, you could say the same thing or similar things about Wi-Fi and acoustic signals or visible light systems. Uh, though they preserve privacy uh, and they are able to pick up fine gestures, they are not really good at uh, having the hands anywhere to work with. You are still restricted to a small field of view or a small area. Uh, finally, even uh, most recently, the Google Sunlight requires your hands to be really close to a transmitter or receiver for you to be able to detect the gesture. So our system hands and tries to alleviate all of these and find something that is uh, reducing privacy concerns, something that can detect really fine and low granular gestures, and it's independent of the field of view. So essentially your hands can be anywhere doing any work, but your gestures are still caught. Uh, next, I look at hand instrumented sensors. Uh, typically, uh, some of the early work had the hand instrumented itself with IMUs, flex sensors, or bed sensors. Now the issue with those is that the glove itself is very uh, which meant uh, it's hard to move around. Uh, they also did not detect hand gestures, and it required some calibration and some effort, some effort to perform the gesture. Uh, more work recently uh, is through using magnetic field, where people had the fingertips uh, mounted with electromagnetic sensors, which release their own field, and change in this magnetic field was used to detect change in gestures. Uh, similar. Uh, work is that electric field based devices like the cap band or uh, the myo band but most of these suffer from uh, having to put in some effort to perform the gesture. So we wanted our device, uh, our, our technique, handsets to not be bulky, to be able to detect these fine gestures, not require any calibration and to perform, excuse <coughs> me, and no effort to perform the gesture. So uh, we present handsets which is a hand gesture recognition system that is intended to work with head mounted devices uh, for these said future workspaces. So the idea is it's lightweight, where you have just these electrodes on the fingertips and you measure the distance between these fingertips to figure out what gesture you're making. Next is they're always available, it means you can move your hand wherever, in whichever space, and you're still able to detect what gesture is made. And you want to detect these really fine gestures, <coughs> like tapping or rubbing your fingers, uh, almost. So the key idea that we use is these electrodes uh, act as capacitor plates and by measuring the distance between these plates you get an idea as to the distance between the fingertips themselves and as a function of the distance between fingertips you can figure out what gesture is being made. So some challenges. Uh, as we saw in our talk yesterday, when you have capacitive coupling and the coupling, most of the signal goes through the body as opposed to between the air, which is what we want. Uh, and the signal also decays rapidly with distance. So even though we want to measure the distance between fingertips and the capacitance over air, uh, the issue is once your fingers move far apart, the signal decays rather rapidly. So it becomes hard to figure out what the distance exactly is. Uh, and finally, hands move fairly quickly, so we wanted a faster sampling rate to figure out what gesture is being formed. 
So usually when you're swiping on your phone or tapping or uh, moving about, it has to actually move fairly quickly. So we need a respective sound. So uh, my talk is basically divided into these three parts. Uh, first, I discuss the uh, hardware and the character of the technique that we use. Next, I'll go over the gesture set that we use, the kind of gesture that we use to evaluate our device and uh, the software backend which makes all of this possible, that brings the entire project together. So a brief primer uh, about capacitor sensing. Uh, a capacitor is basically two trash carrying conductors uh, between which uh, an electric field can be stored. Now, the value of capacitance can be derived using a simple formula where C is epsilon not A over D, where epsilon is the absolute permittivity. In this case, it's A so the value is 1, A is the area of the conductor plate, D is the distance. So as you separate the distance, uh, as you separate the plates uh, over a distance, the capacitance falls down, or drops inversely. So, uh, what do we do? We try to pole so that we have all of these links that we call, as in, you have one capacitor plate as uh, the charge carrying conductor and the other one uh, as the receiver. So you have a transmitter and a receiver. So first, let's say you have one finger as a transmitter and you receive on all the other four fingers. Next, you pole or we pole uh, to have the second finger as a transmitter and all the other fingers as a receiver. So as you can see, really quickly you can find all the distances between all of the fingers. So that would be 5C2, so you have 10 links. <coughs> Uh, so the simple way would be to have or attach a single electrode over each fingertip. But uh, as I told you earlier, the problem is the body is a pretty good conductor compared to air. So the signal would want to couple with your body. Uh, so the single electrode, uh, as can be seen here, uh, would send most of the signal through uh, to the body and that acts as the capacitor. And a big chunk of our signal is lost over there. So, the approach we uh, tried and which worked really well is to add or force a ground electrode beneath the signal electrode you know, such that this is the capacitance we want to measure. Right? Uh, and this way, the coupling is forced to happen over air and not through the body. So this also leads to the point that the glove is minimally in instrumented. So you could have a glove or do away with the glove, but essentially you have only copper tape that's stuck on the fingertips. Or two layers of copper tape that's stuck on the uh, so for the board, we transmit a frequency of 100 kHz uh, from one of the transmitters. Uh, we pick this frequency because Xc, which is uh, capacitive impedance, is inversely proportional to frequency. So the higher the frequency, the less the resistance over here. Uh, next, uh, the receiver itself. Uh, we have a trans impedance amplifier circuit. The receiver signal is pretty weak. Uh, we receive anywhere between 1 to 5 microamps. So that means that we boost it to get half a volt or one volt. Uh, and then finally we want to estimate the received signal itself. Uh, since you will notice if you have a transmitter and a receiver for every single finger, that means you would have to reuse or you would need to have five transmitters and receivers uh, per hand. So instead we use a multiplexer, deep multiplexer to reuse the same front end and to reuse the same receiving circuit. Finally we have a Bluetooth module so that you can send all of this data somewhere and have it processed. Uh, that's the CAP profiler board, uh, which we hope, since that's just the lab prototype, it looks a little, appears a little big, but the components are fairly small and can be uh, made pretty small, and we envision that it could be used uh, even, it could be fit into your smartwatch or a smart bag. So, uh, on the receiver side, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you need to be able to really quickly determine what gesture is being made. So, I'll go over what synchronous sampling is first, and then go over the technique we use. Uh, which is synchronous undersampling. So, in synchronous sampling, the idea is uh, to find the amplitude of the received signal, you sample a signal uh, at a very high frequency, in this case, let's say four times the frequency, uh, and you select S1, S2, S3, and S4 as the points in one time period. And using the formulas of R1 and R2, you can basically calculate the value or the amplitude in that period. Now, the issue is if you use a frequency of 100 kilohertz, uh, that Fs becomes 400 kilohertz, which is pretty big, and that's kind of hard to deal with on a small board. So instead, uh, we use this technique of synchronous undersampling, which was proposed by uh, Professor Joshua Smith of MIT. It's, it's in his uh, PhD dissertation. Uh, where if you assume uh, that the signal is constant over a couple of periods, then you don't need to pick the S1, S2, S3, S4 from one period. 
So what you can do instead is overfill these values over a spread out time. Uh, and essentially, if you want to look at it as phase, there's a 450 degree shift as opposed to a 90 degree shift. So your FS now drops from 400 kilohertz to 80 kilohertz. And to increase the value, and to get a better SMR, you can accumulate these values and average over time of the amplitude. So now we have the board ready. Uh, we hope that the blog works properly. So let's take a look at how how gestures or different gestures give rise to different signals. So the type of interactions that we found were over the net, obviously, because that's what we wanted to check. We also found that contact gives you a different sort of signal, which can also be used, and through body as well, where we are forcing the through body communication. So just to go over some, uh, just to spend some time, you can see that. In the closing test action, originally if you have your hand open and then bring them together, you'll notice that your ring finger, middle finger index, and the pinky of the little finger are already sort of close together. So you would find those values to be sort of higher already. But then the fingers that are far away when they come together, uh, finally they all sort of reach a particular maximum peak value. Now in the case of contact, it's the same where you start at a lower value and then you sort of pass it a particular value. And for the through body case, uh, since you're touching or you're forcing the channel to be through the body, the overall amplitude is less, but you can still see some spikes. So, we evaluated 14 gestures. Uh, we wanted these to be quick gestures and with minimal movement. So, we, we looked at rubbing or sliding. Some of these gestures are inspired by the Google Solimons. So we wanted that millimeter level of granularity almost. And so now we have the raw signals as well. We can look at how we process it to get uh, uh, the gestures. So we use three types uh, of time series classification. We use a multi-level uh, perceptron for the baseline, a CNN to improve on that, and an LSTM to finally get the best results. Uh, we wanted to use a CNN to basically see if we can learn the spatial temporal dependencies because different people perform the gestures at different speeds uh, and their hand or finger lengths are different, which means your amplitudes are also different. And we wanted to see that over a period of time, are there certain patterns that we can pick up, so we use the LSTM. The evaluation was conducted uh, using 10 subjects and 14 gestures. Uh, each subject was asked to repeat the gesture 25 times, and we manually marked the start and stop point. Uh, this was to help with synchronization and figure out where the gesture started uh, and we use tenfold cross validation. So results uh, for a quick overview of the precision recall and F1 score, our baseline performed fairly well, we got 90%. Uh, the CNN, the average was about 94, and with the LSTM we got up to 97%. Uh, just to show you the confusion matrix and to show you some false positives and uh, which gestures were uh, misclassified. Uh, one was the knob turning. This is where we asked participants to basically move or presume to be turning a knob, an imaginary knob in, uh, in space. The issue is not all participants did it consistently and different people had different ways. So some of the people touched their palms, the, touched the fingers of the palms, some people had them in the air, some people rotated about the wrist, which meant that relatively the fingertips didn't change distance. Ideally you would find that if you're moving your hand as a doorknob, one finger gets close to the other, the next one gets close to the other, and there's some Related motion. Uh, so those were misclassified. Next was a swipe up or swipe down, where each individual finger was touched, uh, and finally a single tap or a double tap on the hand around a particular finger. Uh, these values improve with uh, increasing complexity or with the CNN and LSTM. Uh, we also wanted to see the relationship between the accuracy and sampling rate, so we downsampled that 100 hertz signal. Uh, the 100 hertz actually comes from the fact that uh, we are using polling. So what we do is to capture the values of one link, say between your thumb and index finger, uh, it is one millisecond. So when we switch using the multiplexer, the transmitter and the receiver, we wait for one millisecond for the link to stabilize. So essentially for 10 links, that would be 10 milliseconds and that's where we get the 100 hertz value from. Uh, even though the receiver itself works at 80 kilohertz. Uh, so as expected, by downsampling and using lesser samples, our accuracy drops. Uh, but the more interesting and uh, valuable insight is the glove independency. So for this experiment, on the train set, uh, we asked one of the users to use a completely different glove, and we instrumented 
the fingertips uh, with our electrodes, and these black wires are actually coaxial cables which we use to connect to the receiver board. Uh, what we found was that independent of glove, the accuracy is still pretty high. Which means if you use the glove, or if you have a trained glove, uh, and you decide to throw that glove away and use another glove, nothing changes. You don't have to recalibrate, you don't have to retrain. So this tells us that it could be used, say, in the fast food industry, or even uh, for the medicine industry where people use latex gloves. And since it's just copper tape or copper wire, you could just use and throw these, and once the training is done, it doesn't matter, right? So it's clean, reusable, and pretty lightweight. So to conclude, uh, we propose AntSense, a pairwise capacitor coupling with anti system. Uh, we introduce a placement configuration for electrodes and fingertips, which ensures that we can uh, do away or we can reduce the amount of body coupling, which helps in certain cases when you don't want the signal to be passed through the body. Uh, we also introduce a lightweight measurement uh, technique to figure out or to react or find out these fast moving gestures. And uh, our experimental results show that this, we have 97 percent accuracy for 14 uh, of these gestures. That's how our prototype looks like, but uh, we envision or we wanted to have the next one where we could have off the shelf uh, latex gloves or even tattoos in the future. Because if it's only getting the signal from the fingertip to the board, then we could probably do funky things. It's only two wires.